around the Word of God, to our membership, to our guests, to our regular listeners, and to the new folks that will join with us, we welcome you. We trust and pray as we look at the message this evening that it'll be glorifying to God, it'll be uplifting Christ, but it'll be understandable and applicable to each person that will receive the message. We trust and pray that if you've never been saved, that you'll listen to the entire message with an open mind that God might reveal to you your need of salvation and that might bring you to the necessary faith to ask God to forgive you and to save you. And to you who are believers, we trust and pray that it, it might address uh, something that's on your heart, uh, something that's in your life, perhaps answer a decision that you're toying with. Whatever the need might be, as a believer, we hope the message will be applicable. We are going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 41 through 48. Heavenly Father, as we open the book of God, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring the message in His power. We ask you that this message glorify you, lift up Christ, and bring the results that the Holy Spirit will cause. We pray for everyone that will hear this message, it'll be applicable to them, and that not only will we have the anointing to present the message, but the anointing will be upon those that will listen, that they might see as God sees, and they might hear what God has to say. We pray that under the sound of this message, if there is a person that's not saved, they will be brought to that salvation, Faith cometh by the hearing and by the hearing of the word of God. And then as we've said, whatever the issue might be with the child of God, whether it's encouragement, whether it's a decision that needs to be made, whether there's a correction that needs to take place, whatever the need is, Holy Spirit, bring it to their knowledge. Let them have that spiritual eye and that spiritual ear to see and hear what you say that they might make that change in their life. And we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 41, Matthew 5. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain or two. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect or mature, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. 
I want to speak to you on a message tonight that I've entitled The Second Mile Christian. Think about that. Look at verse 41 again. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain or two. This expression came out of old Persia and refers to the authority given by the king to those sent to do his bidding. If a courier of soldiers needed assistance in fulfilling the king's mission, he could commandeer any man or horse or wagon with no questions asked. Later, the armies of the Greek and Romans adopted this practice. In Jesus' day, any Jew could be forced away from his own concerns to help a legionnaire who may or may not have really needed him. We see an example of this in Matthew 27, 32, when they commanded Simon of Serene to bear the cross of Jesus, Matthew 27, 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Serene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. Now the Jews resented this humiliating law and saw it as a symbol of foreign denomina uh, domination. Now can you imagine their surprise when Jesus said, look at verse 41 again. It must have been a real surprise or a real shock. He said, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. I want you to notice some things, how even today this is contested about this theory of going one mile, but instead go two. You see, we live in a one mile world that we even have trouble with. Matthew 5, 38, you have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if a man shall sue you thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Verse 41 again. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Think about it. Now this saying is hard on us because we, like the Jews of Jesus' day, lived in a one-mile world. What do you mean a one-mile world? Well, today the philosophy, what about my rights? See, it's all about the individual. The epitome of selfish self-conceit, self-concern is the first and foremost feeling that the average individual has. We, as a society, of course it's not everybody, but as a society, it's all about me. What about my rights? What about what I think? In fact, it's become so uh, dangerous today to have an opinion that's not accepted by everybody else, lest you become an enemy. We find confrontation, callous confrontation, when it comes to the fact, how dare you disagree with me? We live in a society now at large when everybody is a expert unto themselves. It's a one mile problem world. Now can you imagine? Jesus said, no, one. Uh-uh. I said, go two. You see, the second thing that bothers us with this command of the Lord is that we have become a society at large 
to account minimum standards as being sufficient. You see, it's not what we can do, it's how little we can do and still receive what we should be doing to complete it. It's minimum standards. Today, we have basically become lazy, entitled people who think we're worth a whole lot more than we really are. Number three, it's a world where proper payment for deeds are done. Now, that don't sound bad, is it? Well, let me explain what I'm saying. We live in a world now, you mistreat me, I'll show you what mistreatment really is. You want to you wanna be uh, Mr. Bad? I'll show you what bad really is. We live in a world that when we are uh, challenged about our uh, beliefs or we're challenged about uh, our ideas or we're challenged about our convictions, then it becomes deadly sometimes. And we have a right, we have a right to punish those that disagree with us. And that's not. You remember what Jesus said in the very text that we read. He said very plainly, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. But that's a philosophy. No, that's the word of God. Not so today. You see, this is especially hard when Jesus calls upon his followers to respond to evil with good. With good. Let me read it one more time in chapter 5, verse 44. Look at it. But I say unto you, that's the believer, that's the believer, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them who hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Can you see now the difficulty with the attitude that we have as a society when we have transferred from being concerned about how we treat others and become focused on how we're to be treated and we're to be treated by the standard that we've set, by the uh, uh, choice that we have made. We have become what we think an island unto ourselves. Can you imagine that difficulty? This, like in Jesus' day, does not compute with a selfish, self-centered world. Think about that. But Jesus, more so today than any time in modern time, is calling for a two-mile Christian. A two-mile church. One that is concerned and compassion and one that is more about reaching people than causing people to reject the message. You see, the two-mile Christian turns the other cheek. The two-mile church turns the other cheek. You know what we forgot as individual Christians and as a local New Testament church? Listen to me real carefully. We're not perfect. How dare us to look down, especially on anybody, but especially on those that are not even saved. How, how hypocritical we have become when our attitude displays to those outside of Christ even. Well, if you get your life in order and you get things straightened out, uh, then you can come and get saved. That's heresy. All our righteousness are as filthy rags. There's no good thing that dwelleth in us. We were condemned. We were under the wrath of Almighty God before we got saved. What if somebody had looked upon us and give us that so-called picture 
Well, you know, you, you, you got to get things straightened out before you come to church. I mean, you know, you got to kind of clean up your life. Oh, that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. The Bible tells us, ladies and gentlemen, only God can clean us up. And only God did clean us up. But what we forgot in this modern generation of being so self-conscious, self-centered, and so it's about me. We forgot, ladies and gentlemen, at one time we were where those unsaved people were. We were without hope. Our life was a wreck. We had no righteousness. We were alienated from God. We were under his condemnation. We had nothing to look for but a devil's hell. But because somebody, somebody demonstrated the same compassion toward us that had been demonstrated to them, they shared with us the same Christ that somebody had shared with them. And they looked beyond who we were and saw our need. Oh, today, today, God help us. We can't seem to get past what a person may do, may be doing. Instead of looking past what they're doing and see what they need, be doing what they ought to do, and that's Jesus Christ. Oh, listen to me. We're to love our enemies. What does it mean to really go the second mile? Don't strike back. Don't try to get even. Don't try to settle the score. Meet evil with good. It means to swallow our pride and abandon our self-interest. It means to be slow to anger and quick to forgive. It means to live by grace in an unfair world. Why should we do this? Why should we? Listen. Listen. We ourselves, one day, were lost. We ourselves were without hope. We were unclean. We had broke God's law. We were alienated from the family of God. But somebody, you know, to look past somebody's failure, ladies and gentlemen, is not endorsing it. Oh, how the devil has blamed, blinded so many Christians to forget the reason people sinners, they're sinners. They're sinners. If they could give up their sin without being saved, Christ would have died in vain. And yet somehow, and oh, how easy it is to forget. And let me say, I hear people say, well, I wasn't that bad of a sinner. I, I didn't do that. Let me tell you how bad of a sinner you, you are. You were bad enough to be condemned to hell already in that you have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. Oh, we try to classify sin as bad sin. Not so good sin, but not really bad sin. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We were condemned. You look in the Bible, there were morally good people. There were beneficial people. There were benevolent people. But the Bible said they had not come to Christ. See, ladies and gentlemen, we, we judge people by what they're doing. Instead, we ought to be asking God to help us see what they need. We know why they're doing what they're doing. They're not saved or they're out of the fellowship of God. If they could clean themselves up. Don't you remember the story of the prodigal son? How far he'd fallen down to the pig pen. But what brought him back to the father? The Bible said when he came to himself. See, the father had never condemned him, had never cut him off had never criticized him, but had sent an open invitation. You see, look at me. Look at me, folks. 
the Father looked past his sin and saw what he needed. And he knew if that need was met, the sin problem would automatically be solved. You see, when you come to Christ, the Bible said as a new creature, then you begin to possess the power of the Holy Spirit to make those changes in life. Oh, what a shame of the pressure we put under people. Well, you need to, you need to clean this up. Uh, you need to do this and, and everything. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to kind of get a straight uh, course in your life before you come to church or something. Let me tell you something. You know what our church, you know who's welcoming our church? Sinners. Sinners. Who wants that they come under the gospel of Christ have become saved sinners. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to me. The Bible says very plainly, Jesus said, somebody compels you to go a mile, you have to go too. We have to be willing to pay the ultimate price of self-denial. The greatest gift that we need and only God can give because he has given it to us is the gift of forgiveness. The gift of forgiveness. Oh, you think about it. You think about it. If God had not been willing to forgive us, we'd all perished. But the Lord said, if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. The ultimate. And Paul reminds us, ladies and gentlemen, as believers, the ministry that God has given to the believer is reconciliation. Reconciliation starts with restoring a person to the salvation experience or bringing them to the salvation experience of sharing the gospel with them so that the Holy Spirit can save them. Reconciliation is for that brother or sister that stumbled. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, you which are spiritual, restore one who's overtaken by a fall. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. I feel sorry for those people who think they are in perfection. One day they'll stump their toe, and because they were as mean as they were to others about it, it might be lonely. There'll be nobody there to comfort them. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us very plainly, a two-mile Christian, God wants us to be willing, willing. Don't you remember the Bible said he suffered for our sins? He suffered for our sins. That we might have his righteousness. Oh, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Stop going around with a chip on your shoulder. Stop going around thinking that you're any better than anybody else. Even as a believer, your difference between an unbeliever is the relationship with Jesus Christ. Had we not been saved, we would, have be, we would not be changed in any form or fashion. Let's tell these people, God loves them. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. I want you to know that God knows. God knows every thought you had, every word you spoke, and every deed you done. But he said he still loves you. Still loves you. And if you'll repent, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yet if you say we have no sin, we lie and the truth's not in us. And if we continue to say we've not sinned, we make God a liar. Then, believer, if you don't have that compassion, you've been hurt, possibly by a family member. But listen to me. It could have very well been you in their place. How would you have wanted to be treated? How would you have wanted to be loved? How would you have wanted to be forgiven? Then give that to that one. That one that's disappointed you. That one that's broke your heart. Think of how we've disappointed the Lord. Think of how we broke his heart. But he forgives. He forgives. 
And ladies and gentlemen, if we don't, our life is going one miserable road down the life journey. Father, help us to understand that we need to be that two-mile person. We need to go in the grace of God. We need to go in the compassion of Christ. We need to go with the spirit of forgiveness. We need to go with the spirit of reconciliation. We need to go forth and share Jesus with these that are hurting, that have stumbled, that have fallen, are bitter, are hurt, are injured. Father, we have the healing balm from Gilead. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Help every believer realize, remember, we were not always saved. But because somebody was willing to go the two miles with us, whether it be the local church that we were a part of or became a part of, or family or friend or whoever, somebody went the second mile. And as a result, we come to know Christ as Savior. Bless now this message and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.